interesting point where he's struggling with the concept of economic value and symbolic value, which uh, Baudrillard would later come to comment on in his very, very interesting work on symbolic exchange and death. In, in, the, in the Grundrisse, Marx asks this question, which I think um, I've certainly been mulling over for quite some time now. Who is the, who is the real creator? Who is the real producer? The maker of the piano or the player of the piano? Who is the creative producer in this case? Of course, very confidently, within the framework of an industrial society, the answer was, oh, surely it is the maker of the piano. The, the player of the piano was, of course, some petty bourgeois with delicate fingers who we could brush aside. But the genuine production of surplus value was associated in a very strict sense uh, in, in, in Marxian theory with the place of the uh, productive worker, productive used in a very technical sense here, productive worker in the capitalist mode of production. And this worker was, as it were, the true and total point of exploitation and from whom the greatest amount of surplus value was extracted. And all other workers had to be lesser exploited in a spectrum of possible exploitation uh, positions in, in the mode of production. Well, I don't know how many of us still hold to the labor theory of value. It has been hotly d debated over and disputed, but the great overturning comes with the rise of the creativity of financial capital in the 80s, the fact that capital itself comes to be affirmed as a creative and a highly, uh, as if a productive, imaginary, speculative, virtual, non-existent space of making money through meta-money. And this meta-money mentality is one of the definitions we begin to associate with the the rise of um, financial capital. But in this particular area, we begin to see how the piano player, the creator, begins to take a far more central role in the economy of the societies of creativity and in the societies of pan-creationism. -crea that the production of concepts, the production of the processes of the mind, the production of ideas, the production of research notions are seen to be the key of innovation and invention upon which the whole of the creative, financial or capitalist economy functions. And I would also want to put it as partisanly as that, as only associated with the creative capitalism, but see it in a much wider sphere as the rise of putting things in the service of the mind, as Duchamp pointed out. And do we have, therefore, with this, the courage to face instigation D, which is the distinction and the claim that art activity is a knowledge production in its own right, that art practice is a form of knowledge. It does not depend upon philosophy. It does not depend upon science to gain its validation. It interacts with deeply and richly with these fields, but it has a logic of its own that has to be understood and respected, that there is a way of thinking that might lead us to distinguish between what I call, in my own writing, knowledge and non-knowledge, but also know-how and know-how one spelt with the K and one spelt without the K. And the second know-how I take from the work of Samuel Beckett, who long meditated on not knowing how to be in the world, waiting for Godot where nothing happens. And it is in this, but perhaps without the pessimistic streak of bleakness that you find in, in Beckett, my own references would be to the history of Sanskrit and classical Indian philosophy, where the concept of Aditya stands 
quite distinctly as the third force between knowledge and ignorance is the moment of not knowing how and the moment of know-how without the K and the moment, as it were, of non-knowledge. Do we have the courage, do we have the courage to think through then that there are many forms of knowledge and we should not feel that artistic knowledge and curatorial knowledge should simply be modeled on philosophy or the sciences. The certainty of, this, of scientific knowledge might at points be attained to by artists. We know, for example, how John Latham's artistic experiments were taken very seriously in the physics department at Imperial College in London. So we shouldn't very quickly and all-absorbingly say, well, art doesn't head for that kind of certainty and repeatability and, as it were, predictability that goes with scientific notions of knowledge. But in the field of know-how, we need N-O-how, we need to distinguish, I think, between what sort of knowledge is produced by art and curating, that it is a knowledge that comes from an inquiry into the unknown, in which there is no protocol for the search that has been set up. And I feel that the way we have come to pronounce the word research today is revealing and telling about two distinctions we need to bear in mind. The word research, which I'm pronouncing in the typical classical English way of saying it, with the stress upon research, uh, is now really going out of fashion, even in England. The pronunciation has put the emphasis on research. And that we, of course, love to blame the Americans for. <laughs> that from the other side of the Atlantic pond, this, this mispronunciation, as the purists would have it. But I do think they reveal two things about research. Research is the plunge into the unknown. It is the entry into an experience of the know-how. It is the scene that the great philosopher Shankara Shankaracharya spoke in India of the unknown in which one has to define oneself. And of course I've heard motifs from the other speakers of this finding and constructing of the self or the no-self as we would find in Buddhist or Nyaya Vaisheshika philosophy of India. The no-self that has to be created on the spot and as it were invented as it goes along. This notion is captured in the, in, the, in the pronunciation research. But research, look again, go over the ground again, which is hinted in this word research, is like a commentary on an exposition on ground that is already known and ground that is already charted and mapped out and pegged. I think with that distinction I've come to the last of the instigations. Could we have the courage then, as we speak of non-knowledge, know-how, the courage to keep curating itself as a field of unknown processes, the entry into the unknown, in which curating invents itself rather than turns to a classical body of ready-made ideas in which it feels it knows what curating is about. That rather than feel that curating is an established and set up institutionalized discipline, I would say it is a non-discipline or an a-discipline or an anti-discipline in the sense that it refuses to regularize itself, refuses to create for itself a core essential definition and return to this again and again. It invents itself on the spot through ideas and through the relationship, the constellation of works it tries to bring together and as it were connect in some sort of theoretical form. 